Hi, and welcome back to Hacker 101. This is the first in a two-part series on common Android bugs, how to discover, exploit, and fix them. These videos are built strongly on the Android Quick Start and Mobile Hacking Crash Course videos released previously. So make sure you give those a watch if you haven't yet, or if you want a refresher. Today, we're going to discuss issues relating to Android intents and activities, cross-app scripting, intent redirection, implicit broadcast, and unprotected activities, as well as an interesting bug relating to typos and permissions. Before we jump into talking about these bugs, let's discuss what activities and intents actually are and how they work. An application on Android is built up of a number of activities, each one allowing a user to do something. For instance, a login form, a data feed, the camera interface, these are all activities. Each activity acts as a controller or combination of view controller in the MVC sense, where it sets up the views, talks to the outside world, and generally manages what's going on. Everything you see in an Android app is driven by an activity. Under most circumstances, each activity needs to be published by the application's manifest file, and you can see an example of that on the screen right now. Each one has a name which corresponds to the class in the application, and a set of properties that controls how it works, what permissions are required, and so on. Intents are one of the main ways that activities get started. For example, you can set up an intent with a number to call and broadcast it to the system, or will get picked up by an app that can dial it. They can also be used to talk to background services, among other things, but that's not relevant for the bugs we're talking about, so we'll skip over that for now. If you want to learn more about intents, check out the Android documentation. Intent filters can be added to an application's manifest file to allow it to watch for a certain URL or protocol schemes. You can see one of those on the screen right now. If you've ever clicked a link in your browser and see the open with app dialog pop up, that's because the app registered a relevant intent filter. Now that we've got the foundations down, let's get into the fun stuff and talk about the bugs. First, let's talk about cross app scripting. If you have a web hacking background, this will be quite familiar to you. You're attempting to get an application to run your code, typically either bare JavaScript or an HTML code containing it. And we use that to compromise the application. For instance, you may be able to steal session cookies, retrieve PII, or perform actions as the user. As you can see, this isn't at all unlike XSS in the web world in most ways. So how does this actually happen? In most cases, it's pretty straightforward. Web views are extremely common in Android apps as primary entry points for certain subsections. When you want to tell the web view to go somewhere, you'll typically use the load URL method, which does exactly what it says. Additionally, the evaluate JavaScript function, as the name implies, lets developers directly execute JavaScript in the context of the web view. If either of these come from untrusted sources and aren't whitelisted or very well sanitized, they're prime candidates for cross app scripting. Report 401 1793 is a perfect example of this bug. You should read this report, but the gist of it is simple. A number of application functions allow the deep links, links from outside the application to trigger specific functionality, which in this case allowed an attacker to load arbitrary pages in the web view. In this case, a developer provided a function that allowed access to the user details, which the attacker controlled page was able to access it as well. Fixing this bug is relatively straightforward. There are two key things to keep in mind. First and foremost, any externally supplied data going to load URI should be strictly whitelisted, at least at a domain level, but preferably at the full URL level. If an open redirect is discovered on your site, it may allow a compromise even with the domain whitelist in place. Second, the evaluate JavaScript function should really only be used to run a piece of code contained in the application itself. Allowing any external data here is likely to lead to code execution one way or another. Intent redirection is an easy bug, but one with big consequences. When an intent comes into an application, it's typically used to trigger a specific known activity to start. For instance, you might want to open a specific user profile. However, it's also possible to start an activity based directly on an intent. If this intent isn't validated properly, a malicious app could trick the victim app into starting an activity in the malicious app. To fix this, it's important to very strictly validate incoming intents and limit their capabilities. If at all possible, you should construct a new intent and add relevant parameters and permissions as needed, keeping the influence of the incoming intent to a minimum. If you need more flexibility, ensure you check both the target activity class and package name to make sure it's going to a safe recipient. The ability to broadcast intent, sending them out to be handled by any capable application is very useful. For instance, it allows the system to make interested applications aware of changes in network state or a phone going into or coming out of an airplane mode. However, 
unless the receiver is specified, any application on the system could intercept such broadcast. In case of system status changes, that's fine. But if you're using it to communicate between apps you control or different parts of an application, though you may not want everyone to be able to receive it. If you see a send broadcast call for an intent that hasn't had its class or component specified, this is something that can be intercepted by a malicious app. For the defender side, fixing this one comes in two flavors. If you know where the broadcast needs to go, you can explicitly set the target using the set class, set class name, or set component methods on the intent. If you don't know where it's going, the only thing that you can do is to be very careful about what data can be sent across, you should think of this as writing your data on a flyer and posting it on a storefront when anyone can read it. Next, we have unprotected activities. These are cases where an activity is exported either unintentionally by having an intent filter associated with it or intentionally leading to a break in the workflow of the application. Normally, the order in which users access a given activity is very specific. For example, they log in, they go to settings, they go to accounts, then they go to delete account and confirm they want to do so, which then leads to the final delete activity where their account is terminated. However, if this example application were to expose that delete activity, any application on the system would be able to trigger it at will, instantly deleting the user's account. Obviously, that's an extreme example, but these kinds of bugs pop up frequently. From a defender's perspective, there are two simple ways of fixing this. Explicitly mark activities as non-exported or use the protection level property to allow access only from other applications signed by you. The fewer activities you expose, the lower is the overall attack surface of your app. Finally, we're going to discuss a weird but fairly common bug, mismatches in the names of custom permission. One app can allow other apps access to certain pieces of functionality if they have a specific custom permission enabled. However, there is a big issue here. The app uses one name when creating the permission and another for checking it. It would fail silently and allow all other apps on the system to use that function. This commonly occurs when developers mistype a permission name. Report 440749 is a great example of this kind of bug. Here, the application defined a permission with the name write contacts, but the activity using it called it write instead. Because the write permission wasn't known to the system, there was no restriction on any other app simply giving itself that permission and writing arbitrary contacts into a user's database. In order to prevent this from happening in your own apps, make sure that defined permissions are actually in use. This gets more complicated if you have a set of apps that all talk to each other via these specific permissions, but the concept is the same. Double check your names anytime you're referring to a permission or consider documenting them separately with where they are defined and where they're used. Make sure to check out our next video for more even common Android bugs and consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you never miss a lesson. As always, thanks for watching and happy hacking.